Right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's really great to be back in the community. We have now for a while um, uh, been doing virtual town halls. So anytime we get the opportunity to be in person with constituents, it always um, is a joy. Uh, before we begin tonight's event regarding our recent trip to Central America, I want to take a moment to recognize um, a constituent um, that has achieved something many of us have, but he's done it just a little bit younger, at a younger age. I would like to recognize Elliot Tanner. Elliot, are you in the room? Right here. Okay, come on up. <laughs> Elliot is a recent graduate of the University of Minnesota at the age of 13. Elliot is the youngest to ever graduate with a bachelor's degree in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. And if you're impressed by that, get this. He also recently got accepted into the University of Minnesota's PhD program and is on his path to becoming the youngest PhD graduate of our state as well. So if you can all stand up and graduate Elliot for his amazing accomplishment. So because we were so excited that not only are we Minnesota proud, um, because Elliot is from our state and is making history in our state, but he's also a resident of Minnesota's fifth um, and actually comes from St. Louis Park. And so tonight we thought that we would put it in the congressional record. So he will be, um, in his record will be inducted into the largest record of our country as well. Congratulations, Elliot. And I know that his mom and dad and uh, grandpa and grandma are in the audience. Can you all get up so that we can clap for you as well? Congratulations again. Um, next, I would like to take a brief moment um, and give you all an update to some of the things that we've been up to in Congress since we last connected. The House recently passed the um, Workforce Intervention Opportunity Act, uh, WIOA, which we reauthorized, and my bill, um, the Support Services Enhancement Act, was included in that. We also were able to lead a, a letter asking for the um, Federal Trade Commission, the uh, FTC, to investigate the um, baby formula industry uh, in regards to the shortages that we have all been hearing about. And today, the FTC announced that they are actually launching that investigation. So we're really proud of that work. Um, and then we've also led a letter asking President Biden to extend the payment pause on student loan payments and urging him to go ahead and cancel student debt as well. Um, we recently voted to crack down on price gouging on the, at the gas pump, um, and we voted to address domestic terrorism um, after the horrific ter terrorism act uh, in Buffalo, New York uh, took place. We also voted to authorize $46 billion in, as a supplemental um, in supporting Ukraine in their efforts to by, by fight back 
um, against the illegal invasion um, of Russia. Next, um, as you all know, I recently went on a uh, congressional delegation trip to Central America and would like to give you all a report back um, on some of the things that we were able to witness on our travel to Central America, which was mainly to investigate the root causes of migration from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, and look at the United States role in um, those causes. We found, <clears throat> what we found is a resilient region where corporate interest, international development institutions, and the United States government have played a profi profoundly destabilizing role. In Honduras, we witnessed cautious optimism as a newly elected President Castro and her administration work to uproot corruption and defend human rights. We visited the grave of internationally recognized Honduras leader, Berta Castres, who was assassinated in 2016 for opposing US-backed hydroelectric project. During the visit, the Fraternal Black Organization of Honduras, um, Orfana, and three, three members of the Congressional Black Caucus made connections about the impact of the war on drugs, militarization, and state violence on black communities. Leaders from the Arifuna uh, shared how the ancestral lands of the Garifuna people have been affected by the acro-fuel plantations and tourism, project, tourism projects. A delegation from the uh, Mastico people uh, who were victims of the May 2012 U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration's killing in Awas uh, joined the um, uh, Afrona in sharing their experiences with the delegation. We also visited communities organizing to defend uh, the Yalamato River um, and the hydro hydroelectric project that was financed by the IDP Investment, a multilateral development bank of which the United States is the largest shareholder. The delegation saw firsthand how international economic development financing can benefit local elites and international corporations rather than those who need it. During the visit with the Federal Black Organization of Honduras, Three members of the Black Caucus, Congressional Black Caucus made connections about the impact of the war on drugs, militarization, um, and state violence. Um, we were able to visit the um, Agranian um, platform, shared, the Agranian platform shared their many years of struggle to defend corporate land uh, titles in Bagbayo. Um, a well region for, from the powerful agribusiness actors backed by military and paramilitary forces, often with US training. The um, Garab Garabinol River, I'm not a Latino Spanish speaker, so some of these names are a little hard. Uh, defenders shared their struggle against the Los Brenas Mines project in the Carlos Escalenes Community Park that the eight water defenders who were recently released after 114 days in prison have only been granted provisional freedom. Berta Oliva of the Committee of Relatives of the Detained Disappeared of Honduras shared about the struggles of justice for victims of human rights violations following the 2009 coup during the um, subsequent US-backed regime. In Guatemala, however, we saw alarming signs of regression towards authoritarian rule as civil society is persecuted um, and principal judges are forcibly removed from office. El Salvador is showing similar worrisome trends, but the one but the one constant we witnessed, no matter the political context, 
was the tireless work of organizers and dissident defenders defending indigenous environmental and human rights. The delegation met with, met with representatives from the Association for Justice and Reconciliation, Center for Legal Action on Human Rights, and Association of Relatives of the Detained Disappeared in Guatemala. They shared about the current legal cases for crimes against humanity by the US-backed Guatemalan state in the 80s, including the Exil genocide case and the military diary case, which includes charges for enforced disappearances, sexual violence, and other crimes against humanity. Judge Pablo Situmu spoke with the delegation ab about the attacks on judicial independence only two days after being removed from his position by the Guatemalan Supreme Court of Justice. This removal is widely recognized as a blatant act of criminalization towards the judge who issued historic sentences in the Molina Taisen transitional justice case and the Magic Water corruption case against former uh, Guatemalan Vice President Roxana Baldetti. His removal was the latest in a pattern of attacks against independent judges and prosecutors. Members of the Peaceful Resistance, La Puga, met with the delegation at their permanent protest camp, which they have been leading for 10 years, which they were able to um, uh, maintain that resistance for 10 years at the entrance of the Progreso uh, de Rivada mine owned by the Nevada-based mining company Capes, Casidas, Caside, and Associations, KCA. Local community members expressed uh, their commitment to defending already scarce water resources from the devastating impact of mining and shared their experiences of being criminalized and the police repression they deal with. Some of these communities told us that they, have, they can only get water for um, two hours in 48 hours. Um, they were uh, able to um, uh, sue uh, the, the, uh, the KCA um, and they've brought um, a case against the Guatemalan government for over 400 million US dollars under the terms of the Dominican Republic Central American Free Trade Agreement with the United States. The delegation was welcomed by a large turnout of peaceful resistance at Santa Rosa, uh, Chalap, Yal Yalapa, and um, Tibiana at the permanent resistant camp enacted in 2017 to halt mine-related traffic to Escobol, a silver mine owned by the Canadian U.S. company Pan American Silver. It, helped, it held meetings with the representatives of the Cinca Parliament of Guatemala and the Diocesan Commission of the Defenders of Nature. Community members discussed how the mind was violently imposed on them, how this led to forced in, in displacement of one community, and called for the court-ordered consultation process underway with the Sinka people to be respected and for their self-determination um, to also be respected and for them to be free of pressure, coercion, intimidation, and violence. The delegation also met with Maya and Sinca ancestral authorities from Guatemala, as well as several Guatemalan uh, members of Congress who shared analysis on Guatemala's history and current events, including an analysis of systematic corruption, impunity, racism, and how extra act activism and privatization at root causes of migration. Representatives of the Maya Incha communities affected by the Sion Dam met with the delegation to discuss the ongoing effects of the dam's construction and their leadership on the issue of reparation for indigenous communities. In the 1970s and 80s, multilateral development banks funded the construction of this dam, which resulted in brutal massacres 
mass displacement of the Maya, Aji, in indigenous communities. The delegation also had the opportunity to learn about the current political crisis in El Salvador, including rising levels of political persecution, militarization, threats of privatization of public services, and the ongoing role of US foreign policy in creating unstable conditions in the country. Now we have a, a panel who will also um, present uh, on, on their observations of our trip. So I will like to have the panel come and have a seat. Running campaigns of 
disinvest in the companies, you'd be protesting at the work site, you'd be protesting at the governor's mansion. Imagine if you were told, because this was a foreign company that the land had been concession to, the only response possible would be in international courts, which after maybe a decade of legal fights could result in the ultimate victory of recommending that our president stop the projects and provide repair. Imagine if we were told, even with an international court vic victory in our favor, verdict in our favor, the foreign companies could still sue the state of Minnesota for loss of potential profits, committing our state budget to paying off the companies for years instead of supporting schools, hospitals, roads, and our environment. Even if a new president and international courts ordered the company to leave, the state of Minnesota can still be sued for potential profit losses. So this is what is happening in Honduras. We have supported and upheld a system where international investor rights are legally binding, but a country's citizens' rights to neighborhoods, water, parks, land, are simply not. When I was in Western Honduras in February preparing for the delegation, I, I visited an open pit mine in a community called Azacalpa, who has joined a national movement to declare the community free of mining. Um, you might know that open pit mines are the most destructive form of gold mining. They use cyanide that leaks into the local community water systems um, and causes massive pollution and displacement of people. The US-based company that operates the mine, Aurora Minerals, continues to expand the mine. In the days before my visit, the mine company, mine company had bulldozed the community cemetery. I walked with community members as they showed me where their children were recently buried, where their parents and ancestors were buried. And they told me how the mine said it had the right to search for both them. So Aurora Minerals, a Florida-based company, continues digging up bodies in search of profit. When a Honduran court ordered them to stop, they simply ignored the court, knowing their investor rights are held up by international agreements. So I'm not gonna leave you with any answers. Um, I hope that you leave here with questions that stay with you. When you hear the word development as a response to stopping migration, I hope you think, what kind of development? I hope you think, development for who? And further, if this development was actually supported by the people, serving their needs and benefiting their communities, why would we need so much military aid to defend that project against the local people? So my, my time is up, and I didn't mention much about our tonight's theme about migration. But I hope this broader context gives us a sense of our connection and the level of struggle in Honduras and many other countries. And a deep respect and solidarity we owe to the people of Honduras, both those who seem who stay in a seemingly endless struggle to protect their land and communities, and those decide to come, who decide to come north. I'm going to hand it over to my my colleague Lulu Matute from the School of the Americas Watch. We'll take it from here, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Thank you.
I've also witnessed the expansion of the U.S. southern border far beyond the line that separates Mexico and the U.S. The increased investment in militarization at the border translates into more state violence against impoverished black and brown communities. While families, asylum seekers, displaced subsistence farmers from Central America, Caribbean, and throughout Latin America are dehumanized in the media and in policy as criminal elements or disease-infested aliens, as we saw happen under Title 42 and how it was talked about. Despite this reality, I've gone out into shelters along the southern border and met forcibly displaced communities from the very regions in Central America that we visited their congressperson during this delegation. The delegation was entitled Unearthing the Real Root Causes of migration from Central America. And we underscore and emphasize real because the current administration says they have the answers as to what those causes are. The purpose of this delegation was to dig deeper. And what's also important to underscore about this, delega this delegation and edu educational journey for us is that it's in direct response to the Biden Harris plan for Central America, specifically the U.S. strategies for addressing mass migration in Central America, which was published live last year. And that plan is in motion. It's clear that the current administration has two important, and we add, conflicting priorities. The first is to address what it terms irregular migration from the Central American region. And the second is to secure the natural resources and cheap labor within Central America for the promotion of extractive export economies that will benefit and profit private U.S. companies. To accomplish these priorities, the U.S. proposes more investment in securitization and militarization to make way for imposed development. And I'll echo what we heard on the delegation and what Elise just shared. Development that is neither inclusive of the desires of communities directly impacted by the development proposals or in the best interest of those communities. And to sound that echo, the question is always development for who? This strategy promotes a recycled economic model based on the idea <laughs> that if Central American governments can attract foreign investment, the free market will create economic conditions and opportunities that will keep Central Americans from migrating north. Soon after the plan, the strategy was published, Vice President Harris secured $1.2 billion in private sector commitments for investments in the region, which, and I quote, will be facilitated and supported by strong U.S. government initiatives to address longstanding impediments to investment-led growth. The State Department and the Partnership for Central America is working with U.S. aid, U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, Department of Commerce, the Department of Labor, and multilateral development banks to facilitate new private partnerships and commitments to private investments in the region. Likewise, during a recent hearing with the Congressional Committee on Homeland Security, which included Parkdale Mills, CEO, and a senior executive of PepsiCo, among others, there were calls to action for U.S. Congress to order to facilitate their private company investments and update CAFTA DR. And this is the Central American Free Trade Agreement that includes the Dominican Republic. The executives and chairman of the subcommittee also described their intentions and strategies to reduce U.S. dependence on Chinese labor and manufacturing by nearshoring their operations to Central America. This means that Central America is marked to be developed to meet shifting labor and manufacturing needs of the U.S.-based private companies with the power and backing of the U.S. government. Now missing from all of these calls to action between investors, executives, and policymakers are strategies and clear commitments to human labor, environmental rights, and for the people of Central America and their natural resources. Instead, we can ascertain that private investment priorities and advocacy points are geared towards trade-related infrastructure projects, ongoing tax breaks, concessions of natural resources, as Elise shared, which most of the land, the water in Honduras has been conceded to, given to the 
very companies that would be benefiting from their privatization. This foreign investment economic model is being sold as innovative, as a new solution to widespread poverty, to violence, right? And those are the connections made to the root causes. But this investment isn't new, nor is it the role of the US government in imposing development and investments that don't include the thoughts of the people who would be directly impacted. And what we know is that in this plan, the ongoing investment for security and militarization in tandem with these projects will continue to force violence and displacement on the very people protecting their lands and in their water. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share the microphone with my colleague Claire <laughs> Franksy of US <laughs> Partnership Coordinator Very smooth. <laughs> of Network and Solidarity with the people of Guatemala. Thank you. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you so much for having me here tonight on behalf of New Squad. It's really an honor to be here, and I, I really want to especially thank you, Representative Omar, for having us here and for your incredible leadership in combating human rights violations around the world. Thank you also to the amazing team that made tonight happen. Thank you. You know, the real root causes of forced migration in Guatemala are so varied and complex, so instead of trying to talk about them all, I thought I'd highlight a couple of stories from the people the delegation met with. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, cool. And just to start off with some history, in the 1940s, the Guatemalan people built a democracy that lasted 10 years. In that time, they challenged the power of the United Fruit Company, <coughs> which was a US corporation that essentially controlled the, the country at that time. In response, in 1954, the United Fruit Company and the CIA orchestrated a coup to remove the democratically elected president of Guatemala. The power vacuum and destruction of democracy that followed the coup led to 36 years of what's known as the internal armed conflict, in which multiple military governments supported by the United States committed genocide against, against Mayan peoples. These US-backed governments also disappeared tens of thousands of people, including students, labor organizers, queer people, and children. After the peace accords were signed in 1996, there was a push for neoliberal policies that, like my colleagues have talked about, essentially sold Guatemala's natural resources to the highest bidder. Starting in the early 2000s, we really saw this huge rise in mega projects like dams and mines and huge agricultural plantations. One of these mega projects was the Escobar Silver Mine. For most of its history, the Escobar Mine was owned by Taco Resources, which was a US Canadian company. It's now owned by Pan American Silver, another US Canadian company. You know, local folks, and including and especially indigenous Shinka folks, made it extremely clear from the very beginning through local referendums that they did not want the mine. And in response, Tahoe Resources used repression and violence to open the mine, which immediately started stealing and poisoning the water in this heavily agricultural region. The delegation visited the Esquad resistance and we heard from some local leaders. We heard from Doña Pati, who faced down militarized Guatemalan police while holding hands with her young, young daughter, knowing both the violence that they faced from their own government, and that they simply couldn't live without water. They didn't have any choice. We heard from Luis Fernando, who almost died as a teenager when Tahoe Resources private security shot him and other peaceful protesters outside the mine. We heard from Doña Blanca, whose house was destroyed and whose community was declared unlivable due to explosions from the mine below them. We heard from Julio, who survived an assassination attempt just last year. 
And finally, we heard from Alex, whose daughter, Topacio, was murdered for resisting the mine when she was 16 years old. Despite the huge risks that they face, Guatemalans with indigenous Maya, Xinka, and Garifuna folks at the lead are challenging corruption and racism. Five years ago, the Espo resistance did something that really nobody, so many people, thought was impossible. They, they suspended operations at one of the largest silver mines in the world. The legal decision that stopped mining operations was, part, was a part of several historic court rulings in the last decade that protected human rights in Guatemala. Another incredible example of this it was in 2013, when one of the architects of the genocide, Efrain Rios Montt, became the first former head of state in the world, in the entire world, to be found guilty of genocide in his country's own courts. I really can't overstate how historic these wins have been. However, of course, what we're seeing right now is the right-wing reaction to these advances. So along with criminalizing social movements by calling them terrorists, which might sound familiar to those of you who have organized with Black Lives Matter or Stopping Line 3, the political right is targeting prosecutors and judges who fight corruption and protect human rights. So like Representative Omar mentioned, the delegation met with Judge Pablo Chitumul just two days after he was removed from his position through just a blatant act of criminalization. Despite all the threats they're facing, leaders like Judge Chitumul, Patti, Luis Fernando, Blanca, Julio, Alex, and many, many more are still struggling to build a world where they can live in safety and dignity in their territories. There's so much hope, so much possibility, and so much we can do in solidarity with them. I invite you to join us. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, it, I, I know I, I referenced the Congressional Black Caucus members that went with me. I just want to name them. Um, we were uh, joined by Jamal Bowman of New York, Corey Bush of Missouri, um, but we also had a member of the Hispanic Caucus, um, uh, Chewy Garcia of Illinois on the trip as well. Jen Schakowsky of Illinois sent her um, legislative director uh, to come on that trip. Um, and I just want to give a special shout out to Representative Jen Schakowsky because she's been like the godmother um, on, on these issues for many of us who, who care about um, human rights um, uh, in, in regards to, to Central America. And I want to thank Elise who invited me the first time um, in 2017 to go down to, to Honduras. And we were actually there um, uh, the week of, of the elections that, that ended up not going um, really the way that we expected it to go. Uh, and so it was really amazing to go back to Honduras four years later with this massive win um, and, and having uh, President uh, Castro, um, who, who we are very optimistic um, about her, her leadership and what it means for the people of Honduras. Um, with that, um, we will pause and take uh, some of your questions pertaining to our report back um, or anything else you might want to ask. Okay, we have one right here. Oh, right here. He's bringing oh, you the mic. I also want to recognize okay. this week we have, it's um, recess week, and so we have our entire staff, both DC and Minneapolis, uh, who are home um, for our work week uh, this week. So if you, if you see too many people standing, that is all the staff that works um, <laughs> on behalf of all of you. All right. Philip, who's our scheduler? My question, I'm really thrilled that this delegation happened. Uh, I've been working on immigration issues for probably 10, 12 years and going to Guatemala since 1990. So I know a lot of what you're talking about. I'm thrilled to hear you talking. And my question revolves around the fact that when Fast for Families was in Washington, D.C. in like 2012, I'm gonna say, 
when we were when Congress was looking at the possibility of passing um, immigration reform, mm -hmm. didn't pass. Um, I was involved with Bass for Families, and I asked a question of the senator who sat in the room with us okay. to prepare us for how to go talk to our congressional people. <laughs> and I asked the question, well, when you develop the bills for immigration reform, do you take a look at the root causes? And the senator said, well, you wouldn't want to do that. You just missed me. So I'm that, telling you that background by way of saying, OK, it is 10 years later, and you're looking at root causes. And I'm praying and wishing you all the support in the world for trying to deal with Congress and talking about root causes. And I'm wondering how you plan to do that, how you think that's going to go. Thank you. Well, th thank, thank you um, for, for that question, and thank you for, for your commitment to the people of, of Guatemala. Um, I think you know, the question that you are asking is, is an important one, because in this moment in, our, in the world's history, there are more people displaced now than ever. And so if we are not pausing, right, if we are not pausing to ask the, the, the right questions about why that is, right? Like, how, many, how much of it is due to conflict? How much of it is due to exploitation? How much of it is due to you know, famine and drought and you know, the, the, the climate migration that many of us are talking about? Um, then one, you don't have the proper empathy uh, to pass the legislation and to provide the resources and investments that are needed to address it. And I think when we think about immigration, it's easy to think about refugees that are displaced by war. But oftentimes, we don't think about people who can avoid displacement and how our actions of trying to actually help might have caused that displacement. I think we come from a good place in the investments that we want to make to help create development and resources for people. Um, when it comes to Central America. I remember in one of the, again, I, I, I can't pronounce any of, any of these <laughs> names, <laughs> but I, I remember um, being in, in, a, in a community in Guatemala. La Puya? La Puya, La Puya. okay, I got that one right. Um, and they had been in resistance for 10 years. One, I was shocked because I can't imagine anybody resisting anything consistently for 10 years. And one of the women got up and said, nobody finish, a lot of our children don't want to go to school after third grade because most of them know that they are not going to have a life here. So they start thinking about how they can work to try to get enough resources to migrate. And that's one of the communities I was talking about where they are mining for silver. These are very water scarce communities. They don't have electricity. They don't have enough water to drink. They don't have the resources they need to sustain themselves. And this concession to take farther resources from them without giving them back anything is not creating any opportunity for them. And so that's just an example of Yes, it makes sense, right? Like we think that might create jobs, there's resources that are needed, you know, investment, we want to have, you know, trade function and all that kind of good stuff. But are the good stuff really good for the people? Um, because as Elise was leading to, we wouldn't want what is being done to Central America being done to us. And so we have to think. There's a question all the way uh, maybe the blue shirt went up first with the hat. Oh, and then maybe that, yeah, okay. Sorry for making a run all the way around. We could probably hear you. You look like you have a <laughs> healthy, loud voice. Uh, so I'm uh, just a bit confused over this whole presentation. You mentioned that you wanted to help Guatemala and help Honduras. I find that absolutely commendable. But what I'm confused about is what legislation have you brought up here 
that has not only passed the House, but also has been successfully transcribed into law in order to help them. So we've actually, um, introduced legislation, uh, my office, the office of Nora Torres um, from California, again, like I said, Jan Schakowsky, um, Hank Johnson, there are many of us who are working on these issues. But as Lula was alluding to, um, the policy of the administration itself is opposed to addressing the actual root causes um, and having proper consultation with the people of Central America uh, so that we can actually be partners with them um, in what kind of development will be beneficial for them. And so we do these kind of delegations, both those of us who sit on the Foreign Affairs Committee, the colleagues that went with me are on financial services, uh, some of them are on um, judiciary. Many of us want to try to make sure uh, that in being in these communities and having these stories, because we know how powerful stories are, um, that there is an opportunity um, for, uh, for that to be addressed. We also, in the last SFOB, um, uh, the uh, appropriations for um, uh, uh, the foreign funding, foreign aid that we do, um, invested in a lot of money to try to address some of the things that we've just um, talked about. But we also created guardrails for a lot of the defense funding as well um, that goes into the militarization that we've just addressed. So um, it just seems to me that, can you hear me okay? Yes. That nothing, nothing can be done unless we can at least have both sides of the aisle come to agreement on some of the basic facts, whatever the issue is, but especially what you're talking about. So it would seem to me that if we could get President Biden, for example, to have a town hall meeting with some of you folks and experts on Guatemala, all the countries in Central America, Mexico, and, and on both sides of the aisle, so we can finally do our best to put to bed the issue and the claims of these people coming across the border to hurt us, to attack us, to rape us, so we truly understand the root causes. Because I don't see any progress being made until we can agree on the basic facts. And, and, and so I think it's so critically important to advance the work and the knowledge that you learn and spread it all across the United States so we can turn off the lies and the hate and understand and make decisions based on facts as opposed to ignorance. I'm just so thankful that, that, that you're presenting tonight. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. So I guess I, my question is, what are the chances of having some kind of town hall to address this on a methodical, clear, Educational perspective, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the reasons why we are doing this is because we want this issue to be prioritized. Um, I think it is on the minds of a lot of people um, what is happening in Central America. It's not just that we see Central American um, immigrants in, in our communities, uh, but how we are interconnected uh, is an important piece of this conversation. I do not think that it's correct to say that they are raping us, they are killing us, they are doing all of these things for us, because statistically, immigrants cause less crime than American-born. So I just want to make sure that that's understood here, statistically. Um, and so yes, obviously there's a lot of fear mongering that happens around migration and immigrants and refugees. Uh, and having the administration um, truly commit to addressing the, 
the immigration reforms that are needed, truly addressing um, how we are uh, creating a militarized environment that is leading to violence and corruption in these countries um, is an important piece of this. I think on both sides of the aisle, there are Republicans, I would say, that are, that are committed um, to this issue as well. At one point, we are very close um, to having immigration reform, right? The late McCain was a champion. Um, so I, I don't think it's dead, um, but more people need to start having conversations about this, and which is why we are committing a town hall um, to this conversation. Um, I don't know what other committees you and your fellow congresspersons were, were, are also on, but it seems to me if you're saying that the military, the, the Guatemalan military is being supported by U.S. tax dollars, that you needed someone from the armed services committees to also accompany you to see how the U.S. tax dollars are being used against the Guatemalan citizens. Was there any way that you could, next time you visit, bring people from the Armed Services Committees and what other uh, committees would, who are contributing to the negative aspects of politics see what the results are? So a lot of that harm, as I was saying earlier, um, we addressed it in the legislation that I was talking about that passed in, in regards to appropriations and creating accountability and, and um, transparency uh, with the funding that we do and the training that we do with, with the military. There's also other delegations that have gone, um, and so we didn't want to be duplicative in, in that regard. No, I, I don't think any of it. Um, it seems like we're in between a rock and a hard place because the way I feel is a lot of our government are beholden to corporations. So I'm kind of curious, you know, and I know this doesn't just happen in Central America. A few years ago, I was blown away that Coca-Cola and Nestle could buy the second largest <coughs> freshwater aquifer up from underneath the Brazilians. So, it seems like it's corruption on the government side in a lot of these countries allowing, like you quoted, American and Canadian corporations going there and mining or doing whatever. So I'm kind of curious how we will attack that from here and kind of you know, restrain the corporations from, from doing what they do when they get to these other people's countries. Do you guys want to take and then I can, I can finish? Take a chair too. You can go. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm just appreciating like the wealth of knowledge and ideas in this room and I, as an organizer, I, I just want to like encourage y'all to, to please contribute your ideas and, and energy and passion to the movement. We so deeply need you. Um, and our organizations have all been doing this work for 40 plus years and we are, you know, we are here representing networks of tens of thousands of people who care about this um, and there's so much work to do. So, um, you know, please visit our websites, get involved. Another, um, so I'm here with NISQA, my colleagues are here with School of the Americas Watch and um, Witness for Peace and also an amazing organization called CISPIS, the community with, um, committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador, uh, helped organize the delegation. So, um, yeah, there, there's, we, we need everybody from graphic designers to interpreters to data enterers to, you know, editors, everybody, we need all of you. Thank you. I mentioned a, a conversation between executives and congresspeople and uh, chairman of Homeland Security that happened. Um, and what's happening in these spaces is executives of these big companies 
are advocating for their policies, one of them being, let's look at CAFTA DR. How can we uh, revisit, revamp it uh, to create more space and more power for these companies? So to answer that question, the counter has to be true, right? We need to empower as voters, as people in and throughout congressional districts, we need to empower our representatives to also be in spaces where other conversations are happening, where we're looking at, okay, where can we put environmental protections? Where, uh, where can we limit the power of these companies coming in and out of Central America? Um, so I would say that that advocacy work is happening, is well-funded by these companies that, you know, some that I mentioned, some that are uh, very invested in the plan for Central America, in the strategy, um, and, and the same has to be true on the opposite end, right? It tends to be, as, uh, as Claire shared, through the organizations, right? It's through people power that we push back against the power of these companies to create the, that create the conditions displacing communities throughout Latin America and, and to your point, throughout the world. Um, I would also add, uh, in terms of securitization and money, uh, the ongoing support of representatives um, and, and voters to cut military aid to the very security forces in, in Centro America that are creating these conditions, that are pushing uh, the investment interests of companies, right? It's cutting taxpayer dollars that are educating and training these very leaders in counterinsurgency <laughs> operations. Claire shared, uh, <laughs> briefly shared um, the story of the 16-year-old young student in, in Guatemala who was organizing with her community, with her family, with her, uh, with her uh, peers to push back against this company coming in, this mining company. And what we learned in conversation with that community is that the head of security in that company was trained at School of the Americas. Our taxpayer dollars go to educating uh, the very security forces that show up in these companies to implement the very agendas that they have to clearing the land of people of resistance so that they can move forward with their operations. Sure, the mic. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, I know we're wrapping up here, but uh, I, I think it was distinct that a lot of the questions came from some sort of like, wait, I'm confused by this, or wait, but Congress needs to do this, or, because that's what we're stewing in. I mean, like, that's why I didn't, I, I ended with questions, you know, and like we have created this system and supported this system that locks certain things in, that locks demand for money, demand for profits in, that codifies it internationally. And we haven't globalized systems of justice, systems of solidarity, systems of sustainable environmental movements in the same sort of way. And the, the the reason that we do this work is to complete those net is to build those networks is to build that awareness to build you know congress people and other others awareness about the effects of these to get common ground about what's happening but there are not it's not like our congresswoman could write the bill and fix this you know like there's movement that we can make and she's taking those steps but also these are things that we as as a as a global society need to figure out and so i i encourage you to to sit in the toughness of it, that there isn't a, oh, if we have this meeting, and the complexity of it, and the amount of change and organizing that needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the, these are some of the things we're trying to do, right? We've, we've been pushing for either suspending or cutting security aid in some of these countries, whether it's El Salvador or Honduras or Guatemala, depending on, you know, what's happening there. We've been pushing the um, World Bank on IMF to try to actually think about what development investment looks like. Um, the uh, Hilamito um, uh, River, um, the dam that I, I talked about earlier, I finally figured out how to say it, I, I butchered it earlier. But I visited in uh, 2017 when I went to Honduras, and this is a community, they have a beautiful virgin river that we all got to swim in the second time I went. Um, amazing place, and these people have been doing everything that they can to stop uh, that dam from being built. Uh, and we asked them, what can I do? I was a state representative at the time. There wasn't really much that I can do. And when I got into to Congress, 
one of the first letters I wrote was for um, IDP um, uh, investment, which is a multilateral development bank, which the United States is the largest investor, um, to say, can the, can, to push the United States to pull out its investment. Um, and last year, they actually, the United States actually agreed. Um, as soon as Biden was sworn in, he pulled out um, that, that investment. So that project is not um, going through right now. It doesn't have the, the resources that it needs. Um, and so, yes, there are, there, there are lots of people who are in Congress who don't see or hear or feel the pain of these communities. They think about development. They, they're being lobbied by these corporations. They think about poor communities and what they can do for them without actually talking to them. And so we are up against a lot. Um, but as I said earlier, there's a cohort of us that have invested a lot of our time. I spend you know, a third of my time on the Foreign Affairs Committee looking at these issues. Not only are many people from Central America my constituents, but it's, they are also our closest neighbor. Um, and much of what's happening to them is something that, that we, can, we can impact. And so letters to uh, your, your senators, um, to other members of the delegation, all of that is helpful um, in trying to, to, to raise the, the, the issue to a level of urgency so that we can be impactful um, on, on behalf of um, these communities. And I will just say, you know, recently I was talking to a, a member of, of Congress who herself was an immigrant from Guatemala. She immigrated to the United States, I think, when she was nine. She represents a district in California. And there's few bills that we've been on, and I said, you know, you, you haven't sent letters lately about these bills that we were supposed to move. And the bills have a Republican, she's a Democrat, the bills have a Republican author in the Senate. And I said, we should, we should push them. And she said, um, the Guatemalan government just invested $100 million in lobbying Congress. So I stopped working on them because I can't fight against $100 million. And so that's the other piece of Washington, right? Um, it's not members of Congress just listening to their constituents and trying to do the right thing. There are a few of us who do that. Um, I don't take meetings with lobbyists, but there are a lot of people in Congress that that's all they are doing. They barely take meetings with constituents. And so um, we need you all to help us you know, do this and talk to as many people as you can. Uh, but we are committed to, to raising this issue. I will come around for those who might have questions and, and chat, but I want to be respectful um, of our panel's time um, and be respectful of uh, everyone who gathered here. We were supposed to leave, uh, be done by 8, um, and so we are 15 minutes over. But again, thank you so much for joining us um, for our uh, May town hall, and I look forward to seeing you all next month.